Okay, everybody, um, let's wait just one more minute, uh, Nicole, uh, so that we can uh, have a couple people uh, sign up right now or log on. Let's give it just one quick second. Okay, I see people uh, logging, logging into our session. And uh, well, anyway, my name is Leo Rivas. I'm gonna be your host today uh, for our online talk series. Um, this event is called Pers Perspectivas Contemporáneas sobre la enseñanza y el aprendizaje de idiomas. Um, and it's, uh, it's an event geared towards understanding um, the fact that we have had to take our face-to-face uh, education to online uh, modalities. Um, today, we have uh, Dr. Nicole Hauser. Uh, she's from Rutgers uh, University, and I'm going to introduce her briefly. Okay, guys. Uh, Dr. Nicole Hauser is the director of the newly established Rutgers English Language Institute within the writing program. Rarely houses all of the divisions dedicated to speakers of English as an additional language, intensive English at Rally. English for Academic Discourse, and Graduate ELL and ITA. Nicole has over 20 years of teaching experience and curricular development in English and Spanish programs, both in the US and abroad. Prior to arriving at Rutgers, she redesigned the composition curriculum at St. Peter's University in Jersey City using a translingual approach. Uh, Nicole, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, thank you for being part of this program. And thank you as well for our uh, joint um, uh, research grant that was just approved, part of uh, uh, Rutgers research uh, called Neurodiversity and English Language Learners, Creating a Pedagogy for Inclusion for the Global Classroom. This is a uh, research grant that was uh, um, um, recently approved. So uh, I will be collaborating with uh, Nicole on this project and I'm very happy to announce it here. And anyway, Nicole, please, if you can just take over. And um, guys, uh, our audience, if you guys have any questions, uh, please post them in um, the comments box. I will be looking at those. And at the end of the presentation in 45 minutes, we're going to have a, a, some time to uh, answer all of your questions. OK, well, without further ado, please, Nicole. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, for that wonderful introduction. and. Thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of these talks, these charlas about um, response, the, our, the curricular developments and the response to the COVID um, situation and remote instruction um, that uh, we all have had to uh, create at this time. Um, one of the benefits uh, from this situation, this very challenging situation is uh, the development and creation of talks like this. Um, I've participated in, in several uh, webinars like this, and I found them not only very informative, but also um, really uh, motivational and inspirational and creating a, a sense of a much needed sense of community um, during this difficult time where we all feel so isolated and separated. Um, so I really wanted to, to thank you, to start by thanking you, um, Leo and uh, my colleagues at UNAM. Two years ago today, I was giving a presentation and workshop on translingual teaching pedagogy at UNAM, San Miguel de Allende, and um, hopefully one day we'll see each other in person again. Um, but thank you again for, for hosting this series. Um, if anything, uh, the COVID situation has taught us that our curriculum the strength of our curriculum is only as strong as our community uh, in the classroom and in our programs and our institutions. So um, thank you. Okay. Um, so when Leo first uh, sent me the uh, plan for this, the, these talks um, about, you know, response, describing our response um, to uh, the COVID-19 um, situation um, in our language programs, I was in the middle of <laughs> redesigning <laughs> um, curriculum within RELI as a new program, and then also in the middle of 
thinking about it, rethinking this curricular design as a response to COVID-19 and remote instruction. Um, so this presentation, uh, it's very specific. Um, the title, you can see it's very process actually. This is, I'm really taking you through my curricular redesign process in this moment in the response to COVID-19. And um, RELI is a, a newly established program and we have um, about a thousand students uh, an undergraduate program with around 50 sections of courses. So um, this process that I'm going to, to describe to you of uh, redesigning, looking at remote instruction and the um, importance of theming multi-modal uh, projects um, within those best practices for remote instruction um, is part of, is, is really the foundation for this, this talk. And so I first um, will, talk a little bit more about my context and then the rationale uh, for this redesign and um, give some details about um, this redesign. Uh, when we went remote, uh, this we are still not in a, um, an online planning space. This is, we are still in a response, a crisis response, remote teaching space. So um, this process when, you know, we had to rethink and reimagine our curriculum. I wanted to be very deliberate to first go from a space of remote instruction best practices, um, sort of re reorganizing, resituating myself um, from face to face to remote, and then very deliberately um, programming the ways in which multimodal and online communication um, can be implemented for best practices um, for, to achieve course goals for this, this, the student population. So I'll go through, um, you know, describe the rationale strategies. Um, and then I also have a set of guidelines that I've created for implementation. And I will give an example um, within the course that I'll be teaching. So to give a little bit more um, detail about my context, Rutgers University, New Brunswick, um, there are three campuses, New Brunswick, uh, Camden and Newark. Uh, New Brunswick is the largest campus uh, with around 40,000 students um, in the population. It's a, a, a large, the largest public institution in the state of New Jersey. Um, RELI is a brand new institute. We're about to celebrate our first year in existence. I am the first, <laughs> the inaugural RELI director. And we were uniting three formerly separate entities um, within the writing program in the English departments um, dedicated to um, writing instruction for learners of English as an additional language. The population of RELI is largely international and within Rutgers, a large percentage of the population of international students um, is from China. Uh, as far as Rutgers response to COVID-19, we um, were instructed to move to fully remote instruction mid-March, which was right before spring break for us. Um, we are still fully remote. And then for RELI, for my program in particular, we are anticipating being either primarily or even fully remote in the fall, um, given that the student population is international. Um, there's no decision that has been made across um, populations. Um, but just given the circumstances and what we know thus far. So um, this, the remote response is still very much a part of our planning um, into the fall. Um, and then specifically within that format, classifying classes as asynchronous, um, being as flexible as possible. Again, we're in a crisis response remote teaching situation rather than a planned online um, teaching curriculum um, and just from you know our initial transition students were traveling um, there's there are time zone di differences um, students were in quarantine at times and so the approach needs to be as flexible as, as possible um, now I had mentioned that we were already in within a the middle of a course redesign within RELI given that it's a new program. Um, so really the 
approach that I'm going to talk about, the first, the first uh, question that I want to address, why multimodal projects? It seems actually very commonsensical or even silly to ask, well, in a remote environment, why not multimodal projects? What do you mean by that? Well, when you're in a crisis response remote situation versus a planned online situation, something that at Rutgers and in our program that we experienced um, was with this sudden shift from face to face to remote in this circumstance, it was a little difficult um, to transition for, for faculty um, and instructors to really reconceptualize their coursework and course objectives within a re remote online teaching context. Um, there was a, this sort of tendency to sort of take the face-to-face -face context and place it onto uh, the, the, the um, learning management system or the online format. And that's something that was really a consequence of the current situation of COVID. Um, so in creating this, in, in creating our curricular redesign and our multimodal projects, I wanted to start from the space of best practices in remote teaching and reconceptualizing our course objectives within that space um, in order to create the multimodal projects and incorporate online communication and various online texts um, in a very deliberate planned way um, that addresses both um, strategies for um, rhetorical strategies in writing and then also um, engages students in critical discourse and critical cultural awareness. So, um, and to, to give a little bit more of a background of the course that I'll describe in Rally, an undergraduate course writing that's now renamed Writing Across Cultures, the previous um, course design was, did not include much, at, at, if at all, if any, uh, multimodal products that the students created. Um, the students used a textbook that was a, a reader and um, wrote essays, drafts and final essays um, Microsoft Word um, turned in online, um, but really um, no other modality other than Word documents. Sometimes students took uh, midterms or uh, completed assignments by hand in class. So this is a big, when we had talked about the redesign initially before COVID, one of the goals was to incorporate <laughs> multimodal texts and other types of online communication. Um, so in COVID, re this really allowed us to take this, take the, the incorporation and center it as a deliberate um, driving force <laughs> um, and actually framework for our course redesign moving forward. So um, the best practices in remote teaching that correspond well to multi multimodal project design so fo small focused assignments, uh, monitored sustained text analysis, drafting and collaboration, inclusion of multi multiple modes and presentation of materials and inclusion of genres mirroring online communication. So these are things to keep in mind, um, you know, especially the, the presentation, the small focused um, nature of the tasks and also including that the, the genres that mirror online communication. That's very different than conceptualizing placing a face-to-face -face class online. Um, so I wanted to really articulate that and have that serve as a foundation for creating these multimodal projects. Um, and then keeping that in mind, uh, given the best practices in remote teaching, that allows for detailed rhetorical and semiotic analysis of individual text types, scaffolding um, and really scaffolding and bridging between familiar and unfamiliar genres from online and formal registers to academic writing. And I'll give examples of that in this presentation. And then also allows for student selected examples um, of familiar texts and genres. And of course, a variety of learning styles and modes of expression rather than sing one singular typing your essay and submitting it. Um, so to 
uh, specify more about the uh, pedagogical rationale and benefits of this type of multimodal project design, um, I really want to uh, focus on, uh, again, this is a deliberate themed approach. Um, this, I, what I'm presenting here is essentially a template, a um, framework and guidelines that are um, de deliberate and intentional um, scaffolding strategies based on pedagogical approaches um, for uh, utilizing and incorporating this variety of texts. Um, it's not enough to just say, now we're online, I'm just gonna throw in some memes here and some tweets here and have the students hashtag here. This is actually a, a, a deliberate, thoughtful, organized guideline that I'm going to present. So the um, multimodal projects uh, really, when compared to sort of the, the one mode face-to-face -face model I described, um, provide the opportunity to expand students' understanding of genre, um, expand students' understanding of audience then, of course, and also um, something else that um, is a benefit in this remote space that is always a challenge for students um, with, uh, you know, without a lot of experience uh, in different cultural contexts of the language, uh, developing both academic and social vocabulary. Um, so that's a benefit to this approach as well and to this um, um, project. Also, you can, uh, students will be able to examine grammar and culture in context. Um, this is engaging student-centered, uh, student-chosen texts. Uh, there are a lot more opportunities for students to and, and again, this is in service of the scaffolding and bridging genres and genre awareness and rhetorical awareness and also cultural awareness. Um, that in this approach, students are familiar many times with different types of online texts so they can participate, they can lead discussions. Whereas if you're using just solely academic texts and articles, students will still have to, to search. They're not going to, to have something that they feel very familiar with. Uh, and these last three um, components here, I wanted to, I have them highlighted because they're really overarching objectives that we strive for in all of our classes that can sometimes to varying degrees be difficult. Um, aside from bridging the familiar and unfamiliar text types and the scaffolding, um, developing voice and identity. Uh, this is something that is always a challenge um, in any academic writing context uh, for any speaker, actually. Um, and so by including these texts, these familiar voices, and this variety of, of genres and registers allows for scaffolding of voice as well and creation of identity within the language. Um, and then finally, uh, digital literacy and multimodal posing are, are not just add-ons or extra anymore. Actually, for many, for many, many, if not the majority of professions outside of academia, there are the norms. Um, I have taught different courses to, um, you know, for professional business programs and speakers come in and talk about how they no longer, if they write a five page report, they will be told to go back and create it in to fit in an, an email blast. And if the email is two paragraphs, to take it down to one and then to make it a tweet. So these are genres that are necessary for students to be productive and to communicate on professional levels. Um, it, they're not just informal um, ways of communication. Okay, so now I want to look more closely at the scaffolding strategies. So I want to um, look at, examine some online, I have a list here of online communication examples, um, not exhaustive, of course, and then beside that, some of the rhetorical strategies and academic um, goals, rhetorical strategies that are often components to our courses, um, how they relate. And some of these online communication examples uh, relate more directly to strategies than others. And some span different strategies. And it also depends on the theme of, of that example. So 
Uh, for example, summarizing, paraphrasing, creating titles for works, and even developing thesis. Um, online communication examples that work really well um, are hashtagging and TLDR, too long didn't read. So all of these, the, the, all of the, the strategies that we're asking students um, to implement summarizing, argument, narrative, description, um, critical analysis, they're already known. This is really also this approach um, comes from a strengths-based <laughs> approach where students come from a place of expertise. Again, um, also, you know, contributing to that scaffolding of voice and identity within an academic context. So ha having students notice that these are actually, there's a relationship between these strategies and that they're already using and they already know. Um, memes, infographics, TikTok, Twitter um, can all be implemented in various ways and analyzed to discuss and bridge to discuss, to, to discuss structural or grammar awareness. And I have an example here um, from the language nerds. So some memes, for example, are more cultural and embedded and contextualized in nature. Some, especially on language sites, are just structural in nature and, and word puns or games. And so um, this language nerd example is um, one of those that I've included here. Um, the example above it actually is taken from the subreddit at Rutgers University, and it was a question, an answer to a question by an international student about um, the pass fail um, policy uh, as a result of COVID. And I don't know if, if it's visible here, but on Reddit, for example, TLDR is very frequently used. So this is, again, an example of that social connection um, and the social vocabulary and language and bridging it with the academic. So if students were not familiar with TLDR and English online in this space, um, that is a student-centered space. It's the Rutgers subreddit is, is run by and posted, the posts are only for, for, for students. There are a few faculty on there, but it's this very student-centered space. You, don't, you not only have this awareness of genre and connection of different audiences, different text types, but by using this example, then it introduces stu international students in this case, in the case of Relly, to a, a, a communicative space, a real space where they will be able to interact with their peers and become more integrated. Um, uh, aside from structural awareness, uh, some other rhetorical strategies that can be bridged um, from the online communication examples, arguments, of course, narrative, organization and presentation. Um, Instagram stories or Facebook stories can be a place where I've actually had students draft essays from those spaces because it's a space with which they're familiar. The old school Roman numeral outlining one through five <laughs> that some of us, um, especially from, from, from my generation are used to, are, are really just, they're foreign to students. It, that, that type of approach and that, that type of, of visual structure is not something common, but the online version <laughs> of communication of that type of organization is something that students respond to and then can translate into um, organization of an essay, an academic presentation. And it's worked really well, actually. Um, professional bios, uh, so sites like LinkedIn, for example, that those types of texts can be implemented for uh, any type of activities where you're building identity, um, voice as well um, as a student, right, as a professional. In the, within the major. And then podcasts and community sites contribute greatly, really overall, they can be across a variety of themes and um, a place where students can have other audiences, right? For you could theme your entire class um, around these activities and the end product could be a, a class podcast, for example. So it's not only 
um, providing this connection, right, for the course content and theme, but providing an outside audience as well and an engagement that really cannot happen in a traditional face-to-face -face context where students are submitting papers to the instructor and the instructor alone. Okay, so thinking back to the previous slide, really utilizing that list um, in, in my development, <laughs> um, I utilized that previous list in conjunction with these guidelines. And I also have a, um, a, a PDF uh, version of the guidelines that um, you know, can be utilized, to, it can be implemented for your own course redesign. But um, when you're approaching your course um, and you're creating, implementing a multimodal approach, project approach. Um, these are the, the elements to consider to really take, like I said, that deliberate approach that includes um, strategies for rhetorical understanding for um, composition strategies, and then also critical analysis and critical cultural awareness. Um, so beginning with the themes and goals of your class, be extremely specific here and always keep in mind what the theme is that you will be keep returning to and how the text types, the next step there, the corresponding text types, how they connect and how they will bridge both um, understanding of, of structure, of genre, um, of composing, and then again, also culture. Um, and, and other um, aspects and social historical, political um, aspects to your themes. For, um, for structuring your, your assignments, decide, um, you want to decide, sort of have a, a predetermined idea of the amount of student directed or selected text and led work that you will do. Um, always compile before every course, I have a folder, I have a collection of memes, articles, every single type of <laughs> online communication example that I showed in the previous slide. I already have a, a full um, collection of examples. And I've also predetermined, have an idea of how um, student, how I will have students select their own text and incorporate them, um, whether it's their own, from their own accounts, or going to a site and selecting um, memes or articles from a site that interests them. Um, so you want to plan this in advance. To do this sort of on the fly <laughs> is the biggest mistake you can make. I think that, I keep reiterating that, that in a, an online space, I think it's an assumption that, you know, oh, I'm already online, this will be easy, we can just bring things in as we go. And that's true to a certain extent, and it's good to be flexible, but you also have to have um, that foundation and those texts built up and planned so that you can deliberately scaffold um, these activities and experiences for the students. Activity types. So uh, something general that I'd like to uh, stress is that in general, I, in, in these types of activities, my approach is predominantly to move from analysis to production. So we would examine the function of hashtags, the function of too long didn't read, the function of the other types of text that I had shown on the previous slide before I had asked students to produce something similar. Um, and so you want to determine, and this also, you need to take level into account, student experience, um, and um, background knowledge of the course content as well. So you want to find that balance of um, analysis to production. So reaction, are they going to be reaction type texts? Or are they going to be structural analysis? And you want to vary that. You want to have reactions to the content, to the theme, and you also want to call students' attention to structure um, so that they, to the, to the rhetorical strategies as well. So you want to find that balance. Um, and also incorporate very lexically focused um, activities as well. So you want to have a, a variety. Again, planning and preparation. <laughs> um, 
in production, uh, when you are you are creating those those tasks or the assignments um, really for the course, you not only want to ask what are the desired products for each task, um, what is the desired cumulative product? What is the end result? Is it going to be one final project or how will these texts connect to one another, to each genre and bridge to other genres? So this deliberate approach again is for that scaffolding, that bridging, because to have sort of disconnected right examples analysis then you do a, you you create an infographic here you write a meme here and they're on different themes different topics and students never return to them again that's not going to be as effective for creating that space to return for for um, careful critical inquiry and examination of both rhetorical strategies and content and critical analysis so and in this remote space, as I had mentioned, um, when I was discussing remote uh, teaching best practices, one of the advantages of the remote space, the, of a learning management system, is that all the process is there for everyone to see and return to at all times. So in a face-to-face -face environment, you can tell your students all you want to keep a folder of your drafts and bring them to class and we'll, you know, keep doing this process together in an online environment. It's all there all the time organized. No one can can misplace it. No one can accidentally take erase it off of off of their desktop, even if it was in a digital form. So that allows for this return right and careful analysis and building and reflection and to your final product. So be sure to keep that in mind when you're designing um, your, pro your projects. Um, uh, finally, um, how will the findings be organized um, within you know, that context? It's good to determine beforehand in your learning management space, <laughs> how, which functions will be kept, how you will chart this um, analysis and return to um, different, different assignments so that you have this reflection. So again, that's, uh, that should be determined beforehand. Um, tools and software. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of, a few things. This is where actually, and um, in my experience personally, and then even within um, Relly, this part was overwhelming, especially for people who have, were not, for instructors who are not using very proficient in online teaching. Um, so, the, you know, the, the sources can be overwhelming. So I wanted to just give, and the guidelines as well. So I wanted to just give the basics here. I wanted to distill it down to a few, to the most important pieces of advice regarding tools and software. And I wanted to just provide just a, a three resources that I found very helpful um, to start off with. <laughs> and so um, of course, simplify, right? Um, don't have too many types of, you know, programs, softwares, you know, way, documents, you know, um, bells and whistles that you need to add on um, to, especially that do not correspond with um, or are not compatible with your learning management system. So work within, if you're in Canvas, Blackboard, whatever it may be, make sure it's at least compatible um, with that system. It's, it's best not to, to um, move outside of that space. Uh, and then also consider accessibility and the types of devices, mobile readiness, for all of your courses and all of your products. Just as a reminder, most students work on phones and tablets and not um, laptops or computers. Desktops are sort of a thing of the past at this point, I think. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And then of course, being flexible. So not saying, you know, not um, prescribing, you have to use this type of program in order to make your infographic. You know, maybe they, for me um, in this regard, students often come up with better methods than I do <laughs> because they're more proficient in creating, especially any type of text and image um, uh, product where you have the combination of the two, any type of infographic type 
um, product. Students are much more <laughs> proficient and have alternative ways that are easier than oftentimes what I present. <laughs> um, and just to go over a few, a couple of resources here online, there's an online Facebook group if you're not a part of it already called the Higher Ed Learning Collective. And um, so you could search it on, on Facebook and join. I have a link here. They have um, compiled in a spreadsheet, a list of teaching tools, but they've categorized it and they've actually rated it based on use. These are all instructors in higher education who have this, this um, collaboration was created as a result of COVID-19 and the remote teaching um, shift that occurred. So this spreadsheet, I have, it's a, a link to a spreadsheet, not only has the list of tools and where to find them, but also if they are, if there's a cost or not, and also a, essentially a rating as to in what context it works best for what types of projects, for what types of students. It's a really great resource and everything's there in one place um, rather than searching all over for different tools. Um, and then finally, um, I'm citing a, a text here, multimodal composing strategies for 21st century writing consultations that this each chapter is dedicated to the process of um, creating projects for different types of, uh, of, of multimodal themes and approaches and tools. So there's a chapter dedicated to storyboarding, to presentations, to creating infographics. And it's a great source that really spans um, the very, all the types of um, multimodal composing product pro projects that you can undertake. Um, so I, I just wanted to um, share those sources again, you know, just briefly, uh, <laughs> just the, uh, the overview, because a lot of times this is very, um, it gets very overwhelming. I know it has, has for me as well. All right. So uh, I wanted to end here with um, an example, a detailed example of how I um, incorporated and scaffolded and created lessons for um, a multimodal um, project around a one of the themes um, within a cor the course of writing across cultures. So this is a course that is a, a writing intensive course. It's a, a first year writing course, but um, students will answer questions about culture, cultural identity, cultural identity in the US. Um, they contextualize themselves within that and then also the relationship to culture and communication. Um, within the overall curricular development within RELI, we've moved from any type of skills focused course <laughs> to really um, rhetorical strategies and critical cultural analysis within a theme. So we're you know, beginning from that place um, uh, in, with the objectives of the course. So, and I, again, I want to reiterate that you can either build your projects within one theme or a series of projects with interrelated themes. So in this case, there are um, different, you, there we have examples of different online texts um, for students to develop um, critical uh, cultural awareness of indigenous history and identities in the United States. Um, this again allows for the scaffolding of both, scaffolding of both rhetorical strategies and critical analysis. So students read academic articles and chapters about the history, about um, so from sociology, from sociolinguistic studies, um, and then I also incorporated that students also read personal stories. So this is a text. Tell me who you are. Um, I have the source uh, listed on the, the next slide, and it's a collection of stories on co about culture, race, and identity in the United States. And the authors interviewed um, people from all 50 states about these topics and about their experiences. And this book, it's not a textbook, <laughs> um, and it has a, a, a corresponding Instagram and Facebook page. 
So these are some things to keep in mind too, looking for texts that are out there that also have social media related to them. And many of them do at this point. Um, and then um, the incorporation of online articles on current events and current themes, and as well as examining Instagram accounts that are um, related to then specific um, movements or groups. And again, it, this is, I, I feel like, you know, looking at these visuals here and you can see the benefit of this deliberate scaffolded approach with multiple texts where students come back to a theme rather than reading once about this group and then moving on. So you get to see the complexity. So we talk about some of the general characteristics of populations, you know, common experiences, but then we also address a lot of the nuances um, culturally within a community. So you start to see different, um, different issues for different um, groups and different tribes and, you know, within one group. So it allows for, again, that, that critical analysis and critical examination. Um, I also incorporated videos and Instagram accounts about um, historical, historical videos, but also personal videos as well. And then of course, um, another um, theme that we returned to, we discussed uh, Columbus Day and the controversy and the Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States in that conversation. And actually this occurred <laughs> when um, the conversation was taking place. And so I then incorporated this meme. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. I didn't steal your meme, I discovered it. Um, and we, dis we discussed about, we discussed why, you know, what, what this signifies, what this means. And um, again, this is a, the meme I introduced later on into the lesson, because if I were to start <laughs> the conversation with this, uh, meme, students were not quite aware of the context. So I introduced again, and, and that's why going back to the guidelines, thinking about how will you um, sequence your your texts, um, how we, in in anticipation for you know uh, understanding where the students' understanding are of different topics and themes. Um, so and that's something to consider, and that's an example of something I sequenced later on in our discussion because the um, context was not there. Okay. All right, and this is, and before we, we go to questions, I think I'm right on time here. <laughs> um, I wanted to share this uh, source page with you. These are some sources that um, I'm currently working with and incorporating into our curriculum. Um, I have, I wanted to include sort of a variety here. Um, and, you know, you might know of some of them um, and they could, you know, lend themselves differently to different themes, different types of classes, different levels. Uh, Words Without Borders is a site that um, has both um, stories, poetry in multiple languages. Um, this approach as well is very, lends itself to a translingual approach where students, since students are bringing in texts, um, something that I, I didn't mention um, that is important to mention is that when asking students to bring in their examples, it, it's definitely recommended to, and an approach, a deliberate approach to incorporate examples in other languages um, as well. So uh, this is a, a multilingual site uh, with different narratives, poetry. Um, the Global Oneness Project is, is more photo image based. Um, many of you probably know Humans of New York. It's a very well-known site, but it's a wealth of information and there are so many stories. And it actually, and if you're not familiar with the site, uh, it's not just stories of, of, of people in, in New York City, but, um, um, it also around the world. So Humans of New York has traveled to many different different countries um, and featured stories uh, as well. 
um, Tell Me Who You Are, that is the, the text that I had mentioned earlier about culture and race in the US. The Language Nerds um, is a very, um, it has both incorporates memes, um, videos, uh, uh, articles, you can see one here, language influences the way you interact with the world. This is one that was just posted. Um, any type of structural and pun type memes or uh, text you can find there. Know Your Meme is an excellent site um, that describes the history of memes. And it's a great, memes are great for intertextuality and, and genre awareness and context awareness and actually talking about um, generational differences as well. I use Know Your Meme to find out some of the history of some memes that I see that I'm not aware of. Um, and then of course, um, Reddit or subreddit, Reddit for memes, but also as places um, for places of, and themes related to um, your class. And then finally, uh, this is a site, the PBS American Experience. There are articles, videos of different, different groups um, and cultures in the US, historical, personal stories, features. And of course, it has a, it, all of these sites have corresponding social media sites um, and YouTube and Instagram, Twitter, Facebook um, to incorporate as well. Uh, so uh, that's, that's where I, that's all I have for now. That's, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to Leo to um, discuss any, to answer that, so that I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Nicole, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, let's wait a couple of moments, a couple of minutes to see if uh, our audience has any uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> and as I get them, I will be posting them in our chat uh, so that you can, you can uh, follow them there. Just let's give it one moment due to the uh, time uh, difference between our presentation and, and uh, when it goes live on Facebook, okay? Okay. Okay. Here we go. There you go. Can you see that in the chat? I, I don't know where, where is the, should I stop sharing to see the chat? Um, no, I, you could see it uh, in one of the, I think your options are at the top, the three oh, dots. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the chat should be there. Oops. Okay. Chat. Okay. Okay, have you noticed the effect of moving literacy and academic writing to online modalities on your students? What can you tell us about the effect it has had on your students? So, um, great question. And um, there are <laughs> uh, different effects um, in, in, this, in the situation, in the remote um, shift <laughs> during the spring semester and COVID, um, there are effects that um, definitely, you know, correspond, correlate with the, the situation, um, and especially with our student population. As I mentioned, um, many students uh, were, are from China and during the um, transition had decided to travel back. Um, so that's something that um, affected um, the students and, but in this uh, new space, something that uh, instructors noticed and I noticed as well, it um, provided actually uh, a sense of community. So some of the positive effects moving online in this situation um, provided a sense of community and connection um, for students and also, um, and this is, you know, reflecting on this sort of more inclusive aspect to online instruction. Um, something that I noticed and other instructors noticed as well is that students who are typically um, reserved, shy, non-participatory in a face-to-face -face setting would participate um, much more in a remote space, either one-on-one -on -one in conferencing or in discussion boards. Um, so this is something that um, 
is, is definitely um, a benefit, something that we, you know, that had a positive effect on students um, and allowed for um, communication and um, discussion, uh, you know, a more broadly and, and more inclusive discussion. Um, something that's somewhat of a challenge is time management. Um, something that in general was an issue at our institution, but at others as well that I'd read about and heard about is that some instructors gave more work <laughs> um, that, uh, and had not really taken into account the remote situation. And so that's, you know, that we had discussed how we would reorganize and reorient and um, change our expectations for students in this environment. So, um, you know, in our program, we, you know, we accounted for this, but in others, um, that wasn't the case. Um, the time difference is an issue, right? So, you know, making sure we're as flexible as possible when there is an approach or an organization that wasn't as flexible for the students that was very challenging. Um, so that's something that we're, you know, being very deliberate about um, moving forward. Thank you, Nicole. I have one more. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to read this one to you. Okay. Uh, and it's from Cynthia de la Peña. She says, for junior high students, do you recommend that the projects uh, be creating a meme or a short video? I teach English and sometimes my students have a hard time summarizing their ideas since in Spanish, we talk a lot to explain something. So, um, you know, I think that and this is okay. So ju junior high, <laughs> I I always start from um, a place of you know my approach is very in general inquiry based, and you know not making assumptions of students. I I would ask I would I would ask them to um, give examples of the text of, of of how they communicate online and what they view what types of text they interact with first. So to be able to scaffold and bridge from there and then create examples, create activities um, where if the texts aren't in English to find in English equivalents and or even um, hybrids and then um, have create some analysis activities in which the students notice how these sort of summarizing features like hashtags TLDR are used where they are analyzing in context the amount and type of language used and then they could either create um, the the create you could actually take from the examples where they would create their own um, <laughs> you know meme or whatever or incorporate what was already there at first um, as a model and then build from there so it's really about scaffolding, you know, having these approaches of analysis and building slowly to the production, um, depending on, you know, the level of your students and where they are and, and, and what they know. So um, I think in that case, in particular, um, don't shy away from hybrid texts, from, you know, text in both English and Spanish and, you know, building toward, you know, the awareness of how, you um, rhetorical strategies and, and languages used differently um, in each context. Very well. Okay, uh, I have one more question from Lorraine Rodter. Rodter. Uh, do you think teaching online can be more tiring than face-to-face -face teaching? It is exhausting, <laughs> I think. I think it can be, I think that's another issue. Um, this is something um, within this new remote space in reaction to COVID that's again, um, very different from planned online instruction in that, you know, a population of, of faculty teaching face-to-face -face, and if, you know, even if you, we had, if some of us had online instruction ex experience, the courses we were teaching were face-to-face -face and went remote. And, um, you know, this is, we feel this in, in you know, in, in Zoom meetings and there's, you know, already uh, research on this and, and about Zoom fatigue and that the attention that, uh, especially for synchronous activities is very limited. And, and also for um, creating the activities um, 
breaking up the, the short lessons while they're presented as short bits of, you know, information, five minute videos, three minute videos, it takes, it's very, it's, it's very labor intensive. Um, and also it takes a lot of organization. That's why I am creating, I, I've been working on this, on creating these guidelines and creating this approach and this project development since March, since essentially we went remote um, because it's, it's a heavy lift for us. Um, <laughs> quite honestly, it's a lot, it's like to be deliberate now that we have the, the opportunity to not just be reactive and, you know, we don't have a week to turn it around. We have the summer. Um, it is very labor intensive. And so, um, you know, putting in the time at the beginning and having this organization. And as I mentioned, you know, this is a, I direct a, a larger program with three programs um, within it. It's, you know, so a larger scale approach and, and guideline that, you know, faculty can implement. Um, and we're also, uh, my next step is creating the, the specific, specific activities for faculty because it is a labor intensive process, especially, especially if you're new to it. Um, and so that, that is something that's, that's a challenge um, for everyone in this, at this time. And that's why I'm sort of, you know, wanted to take this very methodical approach and organized approach um, and intentional um, creation um, using this time that we have um, to, to really, you know, set that foundation. Okay, uh, Cynthia de la Peña says, great, thank you so much for answering the previous question. Lorraine says, totally agree. It is exhausting for both sides, of course. She has another question. She says, uh, she asks, how long do you think is the optimal time for an English lesson to last uh, for youngsters and adults? I am aware that kids are a total different thing, but I work with the first two groups I mentioned. Uh, so for online synchronous lessons, is that that's correct. Okay, so synchronous. So really, um, you know, for really a half, I mean, if you're just to, you know, to say sort of if you, a general answer would, you know, definitely nothing over an hour, that's even too much. Um, if, for, if synchronous meetings could be broken up in some ways to, you know, half hour to 45 minute meetings um, with, you know, supplemental materials that are, can be accessed asynchronously. That's really, um, you know, for a, for a focused lesson, you know, if you're, if you have, you can have a, a longer period of time, it depends on what type of synchronous activity you're doing. So if you have sort of like an office hour or an open space, um, that can go on longer where you have a shift in activity. But if you have something that's, that's focused and concentrated, um, really, you know, a half hour is the limit for that time. Um, you know, if you could find a way to break it up, but you know, that's something that for us, uh, we learned right away that administration was, you know, um, addressing was writing to the faculty and saying, you know, you can't take an 80 minute lecture and just zoom it and just stand there and, 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 and you know, on zoom and then even less so for younger populations, um, you know, given all of the variables. And I think that's another issue within this current situation that's a crisis response rather than a deliberate um, online um, teaching scenario is that there are all these other variables as well. Um, people are sharing devices in the same space. Um, you know, access is, varies from house to house, from student to student. Um, so it's very difficult to plan really lengthy um, sessions. And as far and at, regarding attention and um, the energy <laughs> that it takes to focus for that long um, in a remote space synchronously. Um, it, it's very taxing for, for everyone involved, for, for instructor and students alike. Okay. Um, Erwin Santana, um, dear colleague of mine, he asks, uh, or he, he says, about the example you mentioned in your presentation, how long did it take to complete the project? Was it an individual, was it individual work or group work? Thank you for sharing. Okay. So, yeah, so um, for that, the example that I, I gave 
was a unit. Uh, we had different um, units uh, we had in, on different cultural identities within the United States. So that was part of, so the way in which I created the overall you know, project um, coordination for that course was there was a particular, there was group work and individual work associated with each text. And then it also, the, the products from the analysis activities and the reflection and the writing then um, were part of, contributed to a larger um, personal narrative um, on culture and identity in the United States. So for that unit that I showed, it was part of, it was one of four separate units that then um, connected to the final project where students reflected on, um, all, critically reflected on, on all of the um, themes and identities and, and uh, historical uh, information that we had talked about in class. So, and it's a variety, again, that's where, you know, connecting uh, I, the analysis, usually I do, I had, uh, it was, um, I had an analysis activity sort of response questions and um, to the text, to the academic text, and then um, built to production from, from there. Um, some are individual works and then other, uh, as well as um, pair work, but in pair or group work, each individual always has a component. And um, that's something to, to keep in mind as well, um, as far as organizing, especially in, in the remote space. Okay, we have one more question from Ma Madaf. Uh, he says, have, have yet to go to various resources you, su you suggested, but any tips on increasing access to a wider range of student audience? Um, on increasing, well, could you re repeat the question? I'm sorry. On sure. Any tips on he asks, um, any tips on increasing access to a wider range of student audience, of, of student audience? So for the texts or for, for the, the products, the, the audience for the students' products or? He, he does not state, he just, he just uh, mentioned that. It's a tricky question, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I guess I'll, I'll answer it every way that it could possibly be interpreted. So, so um, for um, creating audience, um, this is, uh, you know, something that in expanding audience for student writing, um, this is something that um, it can be built in very easily in an online format that would actually, you know, uh, expand beyond a learning management system where students are commenting or contributing to a site. Um, there is another, there are some sources out there, for example, the National Writing Pro Project um, is a site where um, students could submit work um, and collaborate um, to, uh, to feature their writing, to submit their writing for publication, um, something that we're doing uh, at Rally is that we will be creating um, e-zines and um, magazines for online magazines for um, to showcase student work, um, both research-based and narrative. So this is something, um, given this remote context, we are going to be featuring the students' projects um, on our site as well. So um, you know, within the the website that you have in online spaces of your institution or your program, you can create um, more spaces for students to expand their audience um, broadly outside of the class. Um, that's something that's really important for um, an important component and, and benefit to this type of approach is that you have, a, you have so much um, a wider range of audience um, that students are are writing for and considering. Um, and you also in online platforms with features like commenting um, and reviews, uh, you have examples of reactions and you can actually analyze 
your your audience re audi the audience reaction to certain styles of writing and themes um and take that information to um you know in order to to compose you know in in consideration when you're when you're creating your own texts and writing so i'm not sure i really i sort of address the the student outside audience component to that um so I hope that was what he was that, that's I hope that's what he was looking for <laughs> Me, me too. <laughs> okay, Nicole. Well, we have come to the end of this presentation. Uh, on behalf of Extension San Miguel de Allende, de la Nes León Unam, I want to thank you so much for being with us today, for accepting the invitation, and for giving us such a wonderful talk. Um, and we hope to have you in future events as well. Thank you so much, Leo. I look forward to future collaborations. Um, and uh, I guess, I don't know if you would, could post um, my information as well. Uh, anyone can feel free to reach out to me um, with any questions to email me. If you could post um, uh, my information, if I if I send it to you, or you can you know include it along um, maybe uh, when you post this talk, that would be great. Absolutely, we'll post your information. Thank you very much. I'm going to end our um, uh, live on Facebook right now. Thank you to okay. our audience. Thank you everybody for being with us. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.